In the past on the channel, whenever there has been a new platform launch or a chipset update for either AMD or Intel, I've done my best to bring you guys a motherboard roundup. Now, while it's impossible to feature every single new motherboard on the market, I feel like this gives us a nice cross section of what's available and also educates potential consumers about features, price tiers, and aesthetics. Now that Intel has finally blessed us with some budget boards for their coffee-like lineup, it's high time we gave them their time in the sun. Looking to cool your CPU? Look no further than the Enermax Lick Fusion. Featuring a 240mm radiator, twin TB RGB fans, an innovative inline pump design, and an all new block with integrated flow meter and awesome RGB LED lighting, the Lick Fusion keeps your parts cool and your PC looking even cooler. Check out the link in the video description to learn more. Now before we dive headfirst into these four boards I have in front of me, it's important to understand just what Intel was trying to accomplish here. I mean, Boards built around the Z370 chipset have been released to market now for six or seven months, and all Coffee Lake processors run just fine using them. So why release new motherboards? Well, it has to do mainly with the fact that unlike AMD, Intel offers both locked and unlocked versions of their processors. And for the most part, all CPU SKUs have been available for purchase for quite a while. Z370 motherboards allow for overclocking, but if you have no interest in doing so, or if you buy a locked Intel i3, i5, or even i7, overclocking is a feature that you either don't want or can't physically use. In this case, you're paying extra for better power delivery and higher quality MOSFETs for literally no reason. Additionally, Z370 motherboards support multi-GPU configurations, which are becoming less popular in general, but also isn't a feature most budget builders would ever use. Some of the new boards do support Crossfire, but I haven't yet found one that lists SLI support. It was actually slightly frustrating that the only boards available for locked, but otherwise excellent processors like the i5-8400 were higher costed Z370 offerings. If you just wanted something cheap, the bare bones Z370 motherboards were almost completely stripped of other features. There had to be some sort of a compromise, and that's where the budget Intel chipsets come in. Both H370 and B360 boards remove the ability to manually overclock your CPU, although Turbo Boost still does work just fine. The memory speed is also limited to 2666, so don't go investing $400 in a 5000 megahertz memory kit and expect it to perform any better than something that costs a third as much. Additionally, the major deletions are lack of SLI support and a reallocation of dedicated PCIe lanes. Beyond that, you actually get a host of new features that Z370 doesn't support. First and foremost, native Wi-Fi support is now baked directly into the chipset. Whereas before, if you wanted Wi-Fi on your motherboard, the manufacturer had to include a Wi-Fi module in an M.2 slot. That's not to say that every H370 and B360 motherboard will actually have Wi-Fi built in, but the functionality is there and easier and cheaper to implement. There is also native support for USB 3.1 Gen 2 connectivity, and while this is something that has been featured on other motherboards with other chipsets, in the past this has had to be done with third-party controllers integrated onto the PCB. Now Intel gives you this functionality right in the chipset, which again brings down costs. The differences between the H and B series of boards here is not all that substantial. There's a reduction in the maximum number of USB ports from 12 to 10, but other than that, functionally, these boards are pretty much identical for the use cases that 99% of people will put them through. The bottom line is that they both have less robust power delivery due to the lack of overclocking support and improved features on the chipset itself, all leading to reduced end user cost versus similarly featured Z370 boards. Today, we've got four motherboards to look at, one from each of the major manufacturers you're likely to consider when doing your next Newegg or Amazon shopping spree. Starting at the low end of the price scale and working our way up, 
we have the ASRock B360 Pro 4. The Pro 4 retails for $95, but as of the filming of this video, it was on sale on Newegg for $87. That's quite the steal for what you get because even though there are no fancy RGB LEDs, you get an attractive, completely color neutral black and gray PCB design with black IO shroud. Power delivery is advertised as 10 phases, but honestly, we won't be looking at that aspect of these products with much scrutiny. What you do get is support for Crossfire if you've got a pair of RX 580s along with HDMI, DVI, and VGA outputs on the I.O. The rest of the I.O. has five USB Type-A ports and a USB-C, along with an Intel Gigabit LAN port. You have a good amount of storage options with two M.2 slots and six SATA ports. But don't mistake this tiny M.2 for where to plug in another SSD. This is actually for a dedicated Wi-Fi module if you want to add that functionality to the board, as it does not come standard. One thing that you will not find here is an RGB header. So make sure if you're planning on integrating any RGB peripherals that you have a controller to use them with. Gigabyte's B360 RS Gaming 3 Wi-Fi is up next, and I was genuinely surprised with how much stuff they managed to pack onto this board while keeping the MSRP to $120. As the name suggests, you get a Wi-Fi module in the box that installs to one of the three M.2 slots. The other two M.2s are for your storage, with one of them even coming with a thermal guard, which should, theoretically, help dissipate some heat from the SSD controller and prevent performance degradation over time. You also get some bling features in the form of an RGBW header and a digital LED pin header for control via the RGB Fusion software. The chipset and audio traces also have a little RGB effect to them, with the LEDs shining through the Aorus Eagle as the board is powered on. Gigabyte also uses a really nice looking VRM heatsink design that kind of fades into the IO shroud, although I could do without the orange accents here. Still though, this is fairly subtle and won't detract much from color neutrality. The rear I.O. has seven USB Type-A ports and one Type-C, including some of each of USB 2, USB 3.1, and USB 3.1 Gen 2. One of the things I like about the Aorus motherboards is that the fan headers are all of the hybrid variety, meaning that you can plug in an A.I.O., CPU fan, case fan, pump, or even a water flow sensor to any of the headers with full monitoring and control. At $130, MSI's B360 Gaming Arctic actually takes a step back in features, but trades off for a really striking appearance. The all-white PCB along with the white LED audio traces and white LED backlighting are quite the contrast from everything else here. And I think that is really the selling point of this board. You only get one M.2 slot and four SATA ports, so storage options are kind of limited. And this is the only offering here without an IO shroud built onto the board. The VRM heatsinks are modestly sized, although as we've already discussed, this shouldn't really affect performance in any significant way. There is an MSI Mystic Light RGB header along the bottom edge, so you can coordinate lighting effects through software. The rear I.O. does give you DisplayPort, which is nice to see, but only five USB Type-A ports along with a Type-C. The same config as on the $90 ASRock Pro 4. Although feature-wise, this isn't really all that impressive, I can speak to personal experience while building with this motherboard as it is what we used for last month's white build, which you could find right up here. It gave me zero issues, the BIOS is well laid out, XMP worked flawlessly, and we built a hell of a system. Plus, it's all white, which is a selling point in and of itself. The ROG Strix H370F Gaming from ASUS not only has the longest name of any product on this table, but also the highest price at $140, and correspondingly the most to offer the end user. We first see the overall appearance of this board as a nice blend of black and silver with some RGB LEDs poking out from the really premium looking IO shroud. I have mixed feelings on the ROG and Strix branded scribbling that's printed all over the PCB, but after you look at it for a few minutes, those tend to just kind of fade away anyway. The IO features a robust video output selection of HDMI, DVI, and DisplayPort, along with a total of six USB Type-A's and one Type-C. You also get the shield built right onto the board, a feature that up until recently was reserved for the $500 tier Halo products. 
There's an Aura Sync RGB header at the bottom of the board, and if we look to the left, we see ASUS's proprietary ROG Supreme FX audio solution, providing a cleaner and stronger output to your speakers or your cans. The right edge has six SATA ports laid out side by side, which is unusual and kind of cool looking. If you want to <laughs> ask more storage, what am I writing? If you want to ask more storage. If you want to add more storage, there are two M.2 slots with one of them sporting an RG branded heatsink. One feature which I think would have made this a killer package would have been onboard Wi-Fi. But other than that, and maybe I guess power and reset switches, I don't know that much else is missing for a sub $150 motherboard. So as you guys can see for $140 all the way down to sub 100 bucks, you can grab yourself a motherboard for your new i3 processor that sports most of the features of the Big Brother Z370 products. This is a welcome change to a market segment that until now often saw people spending more on their motherboards than on their processors, which should almost never be the case. So which one of these motherboards is your favorite? Do you prefer one that I don't have on the table? Let me know down below in the comments. Also don't forget that you can support me directly by picking up a shirt in my merch store, linked down below. And of course, get subscribed to the channel if you're not already. As always guys, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.